What kind of questions? Any questions? For the homework? Just about anything. About anything where we are in the book. I think we're we're uh, basically at the beginning of section four point three today. Um, can you talk a little bit more about number 20? I know it was just a grad problem, but I was like okay. looking at it and I didn't, you said it was infinity, the expectation was infinity. Somehow I just did not okay. see that at all. <laughs> Let's go ahead and look at problem 20, 4.20. Um, can I follow that example? Which example? Well, they had one with a stick where they basically pick two random, uh, I mean two uniform variables like U1, U2, and they're like the breaks. One represents, you know, one, one part of the stick, one represents the other part of the stick. Except in the example they were doing like the average. Uh, they were finding like the average di distance between the two or something. Oh, okay. Let's see. They were they making two breaks? Well, just one break. And one end is like I call one end like U2, the other end U1, U2 bigger than U1, and just did the double integral against the uniform density. Okay. Is this the one where you have um, z um, x greater than 0, less than y, less than 1, or something? No, it's that. just one break, isn't it? There's only one break. Okay. There's one variable. Mm -hmm. We're going to make a break up here. Let's say. Let's say. This is x. The break is here. Okay. Then you then you can express the longer piece to the the ratio of the longer piece to the smaller piece as a function g of x. So g of x is equal to let's see it's x over one minus x if x is bigger than half. And it's 1 minus x over x if x is less than a half. Okay, so its minimum value is 1, in fact. g of x is always greater than or equal to 1. That is the ratio of the longer piece. To, so whatever the expectation is, if it exists, it's, well, first is equal to 1. So I can, I can make the expectation exist fail if I allow plus infinity. Is a possibility, but does, is it possible to have plus infinity? Let me argue that it would be. Let me argue that it would be. I don't know. I guess it depends on how you take the ratios. If you take the, um, it's basically the largest to smallest, right? So if you put the um, smallest in the numerator and the largest in the denominator. Then oh, the then smallest. that's different. They said the ratio of the larger is the smallest. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was going to be, if you want to put it upside down, that's a different problem. Mm -hmm. and then, of course, oh, okay. the, 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 uh, then I the expectation it. is uh, not zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Then if you get like a number close to zero at the denominator, then that will make well, it could. I mean, there are infinitely large possible values, but that's true of a normal round variable as well. When you start integrating, you get natural logs of zeros? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you get natural logs of zero or something like that. So, so, so all you have to do is, so you can you get the expectation of g of x is what you want now. Okay. That's what you want to compute, which is integral g of x times f of x dx, where f of x is the density of x. Zero to one, I can just put, uh, because f of x is supported in zero to one, but f of x is just one. So this is simply integral zero to one g of x dx times one dx, because one is the density. All right, and so then you just go ahead and you do that. You know, integrate from. It's enough to just. I think the integral. From so to a half would by symmetry is equal to the integral from a half to one, right? But they're both infinite. Okay. Put some logs in there. Okay. You, you
you kind of, what's happening is it's kind of a, uh, okay, when X is uh, big, so you're in this situation, okay, what does 1 minus X look like? Let's say X is about 1 minus 2 to the minus K, all right? If X is about 1 minus 2 to the minus K, let's go to the plus and again. This is one way to do it. Another way to sort of argue to, to see that it should be plus infinity is that when x is about is 1 minus 2 to the minus k, uh, or between 1 minus 2 to the minus k and, and let's say halfway to the boundary 1, all right, which would be 1 minus 2 to the minus k plus 1. Okay. So this is, let's say, 1 minus a fourth, and this is 1 minus an eighth. Three quarters, and three quarters and seven eighths, for example. When k equals two, we're talking about three quarters and seven eighths. Okay, so let's take x between those two. Okay, well then x is about the numerator is about one. Okay, it's more than a half anyway, and I'm going to let k get bigger. Okay, so I'm going to consider x between three quarters and seven eighths, then between seven eighths and fifteen sixteenths, then between fifteen sixteenths and thirty one thirty seconds, and so on and so forth. Okay. Well, how much probability is associated here? Well, one eighth, about two to the minus k, or two to the minus k plus one. The difference between those two numbers, in fact, you can write it out as two to the minus k plus one. You know a little bit about dyadic arithmetic. Okay, two to the minus k minus two to the minus k plus one. The one fourth minus an eighth is an eighth. Okay. So this probability is 2 to the minus k plus 1. And what's the size of the variable? The size of the variable, well, roughly the numerator is about 1. Okay, this is bigger than a half. So we get the lower bound it. And the bottom is small. It's the 1 minus x. It's the 1 quarter, okay, at most, okay? So roughly speaking, you're getting something of order 2 to the k, you know, up to a constant factor of 4, let's say, maybe it might work off by a factor of 4. 2 to the k, with probability 2 to the minus k. So I add that up as k goes from 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay. So then you get infinite, infinite series of 1s. Okay. 1 plus 1 plus 1. So in other words, the expectation is, of, is infinity. That way. But that's kind of, kind of estimate. So even though it's a very small probability that you'll be up here at the end, the ratio is just as big as the probability, okay? Okay. Then you have, you only consider this piece negative, this is a smaller piece. So it's even a smaller probability, but the ratio is even just as big, okay? Because take each of these pieces into account. Okay. Infinite expectation. Infinite expectation. All right. Anything else about those homework problems? That was kind of a tough assignment. Uh, but the next one uh, is long, even though there are a lot more answers given in the back, uh, which should be helpful. There, it's kind of long and very computational. So let's get, we have to get up to speed on the computation. He's really going to uh, test you on how to calculate a variance. And, and uh, so what we want to go to now is the variance of the sum. I'm going to finish up notes 10. I'm going to go blast through it a little bit quickly so I can get into notes 11. So I want to get up to speed on the computation. Be ready to roll, okay? So let's go ahead and suppose we have um, the variance of the sum. Let's just go ahead and... Suppose um, x and y are random variables with respective means and variances. Um, well, we call them u1 and u2. And 
sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared. The author often uses the subscript x and y rather than 1 and 2. Here I think 1 and 2 are just easier to write for me. But in the, even in the problems, he's going to refer to sigma sub x as a standard deviation. So this, this is going to mean the standard deviation of x equals the square root of the variance of x. So suppose I know the means and variances, maybe, because I know the uh, marginal densities of x and y. Does that tell me how to compute the variance? Do I know how to compute the uh, variance of x plus y? From these informations? The answer is no. The answer is no unless um, if I know x and y are independent, then I know. But if they're not independent, then I don't. So the, the example given in the text was you go ahead and consider the, the uh, a density with a parameter in it, f of x, y equal to consider the answer is no, unless x and y are independent. For example, or some other condition is no. Except, let's see that. Let's consider f of x y equals one plus uh, alpha times one minus two x times 1 minus 2y. So I'm actually going to consider a one parameter family of densities. And guess where this came from? <laughs> this is a density that has both um, marginals uniform. And so actually then mu1 equals mu2 equals a half and sigma1 squared equals sigma2 squared equals a 12. And we should do a little bit of arithmetic on the side to make sure we know what the, the mean and variance of uniform are. <laughs> okay. So first, it's clear that this is symmetric in x and y, so it would be enough to know what the marginal density of x is. Let's just check this. Check that the marginal density of x is uniform. I integrate fxy dy, right, to find the marginal density of x. Everybody with me on that? Okay, so uh, I need to tell the region of, of uh, support of this density. This is the a density for 0 less or equal to x less than or equal to 1, and 0 less or equal to y less than or equal to 1, and 0 else. Okay, so just on the unit square. Let's see, if I integrate now y, that means I'm just going to integrate y goes from 0 to 1, in this case, is that the way I have it. So I want to show the support. The support is the unit square here. So. I want to, if I fix x, then I need to integrate over a vertical line through x. This is the, the dots representing the random variable, the random pairs, x, y. Okay? Think of dots in here. It's representing the random pairs, x, y. Just thinking, for each person, you, you, get, a random, you get a pair of numbers and you plot it in the square. Okay? And these, these, pairs are obeying that density law right here, okay, so that, no, I can't do a very good justice to that, okay. Uh, let's see. Here alpha is between minus 1 and 1. This makes sense for alpha between minus 1 and 1. Uh, because this product is between, uh, is, is between minus 1 and 1. If, if x and y are between 0 and 1, okay, and then this thing is between minus 1 and 1, then this whole contribution to this plus 1 can't be less than, can't make the whole thing negative. So this is a non-negative quantity, all right? So that's why alpha is between minus 1 and 1. If I take this to be, then I, and so then I'll get some picture, you know, where it's, where this density is largest, I get more dots in that region, okay? 
per square unit, okay? All right, we've got, we won't talk about that. Now, this is, if I just integrate out y, what do I get? equals 0 to 1, 1 plus alpha 1 minus 2x, 1 minus 2y dy. Well, the 1 just gives me a 1, right? But now, by its, x is fixed, alpha is a constant. Integrate 1 minus 2y from 0 to 1. Well, 1 minus 2y runs from minus 1 to 1, you know. It's all by symmetry. This, this just gives you 0. I'm not going to do the integration. Okay? Good. Yeah. 1 minus 2y integrated from 0 to 1. Well, 1 would give you 1. 1 will give you minus Just forget, this is a constant. 1 minus 2x and alpha. Yeah. Uh -huh. Pull that up. 1 minus 2y would give you a 1. The 2y would give you a y squared from 0 to 1, which is another 1. Okay? Okay, so this, this is a linear term running from minus 1 to 1. So and maybe in your mind's eye, you can sort of see that that would cancel out. Okay? So that would give you a zero. So that's the one. That's the density. Zero less root of x less root of one. So that indeed is a uniform density. Okay. The mean, therefore, mu one is a half. What's sigma one squared? Mu one. Uh, you know, I call mu one the mean of x. Okay. What's sigma one squared? One over twelve. Yeah. Some people know that. That's the expectation of x squared minus uh, mu1 squared for the formula for variance, which would be integral x squared 1 dx 0 to 1 minus a half squared. Integral of x squared is a third minus a fourth. A third minus a fourth is a twelfth. This is a lot of the examples in the book where they just do the uh, variance of the unit from 0 to 1. Okay? So remember that. What if I had the variance of a uniform on a different interval? Like A B, what's the variance of a uniform on A B? Didn't I do that once again? Yeah, I could write everything out. Let's just put it this way. Suppose I had a uniform on zero to one hundred. So let's say uh, no, I pick a number random between zero and hundred. What would its variance be? Properties of variance. Does anybody know of properties of variance? Okay, what if I, I had, let's see, I would generate, I could take, so uniform 0 to 100. How would I talk about a uniform 0 to 100? This is just on the side. I could talk about 100 times the uniform on 0 to 1, right? So this equals the variance of 100u, where u. Is uniform on zero to one, zero to one. I'm just going to show you some tricks right now, so we get some answers. <laughs> okay. Now, what's the variance of a hundred times? Hundred times the variance of you. Yeah. Third. Uh, the variance of no. The variance is not a linear operation. In other words, if I take, if I take the variance of a x. That is equal to the expectation of AX quantity squared minus the expectation of AX that quantity squared. Okay? Expectation is linear. A will square, come outside to E, so this will be A squared, EX squared, minus this A will come out this E, and then it will be squared minus A squared, E of X. Square. So I simply get a squared times the variance of x. So you have to know this formula. So then if I now take the standard deviation of ax, it does go out as a times the standard deviation of x with maybe an absolute value sign of a. Right? So the standard deviation of ax is equal to 
absolute value of a times the standard deviation of x. I take square roots on both sides. The square root of a squared is the absolute value of a. So if you think of a as positive, then you can forget about the absolute value. Of Just being a little careful here. Okay. Standard deviation always a non-negative quantity variance always a non-negative quantity. Okay. So, therefore, this is 100 squared times the variance of u. The variance of u we just calculated and have memorized by example is 112. Okay. So this comes out 100 squared over 12. And the standard deviation is 100 by the square root of 12. So the standard deviation of this uh, of uniform 0 to 100 equal to 100 over the of 12. Okay? What if it was uniform on 100 to 200? What if I picked a number of random between 100 and 200? Same as standard deviation. Okay. Um, got two different answers floating around. Which What's your reasoning? <laughs> okay. You should just be able to translate it. Standard deviation would be the same. Standard deviation would be the same if I translate it. Okay. Standard deviation, so the variance of the variance of AX plus B, like this, give them a pen. Everybody will be happy if they want to reread this. AX plus B. If I if I move the variable over, so to speak, in other words, if I took 100 u plus 100, right, that would be how I could represent a uniform between 100 and 200. I could take 100 times the standard unit uniform and add 100, right, and get a number between 100 and 200. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this would be equal to the variance of AX. Or in general, I could say this. Maybe don't confuse it with A. Variance of x plus b is equal to the variance of x. If I shift the random variable, it doesn't change its variability at all. Because that's, if I shift the random variable, it also shifts the mean by the same amount b, right? If I move, so then the new centering is shifted, and uh, it just, if I've got this, this thing, this is the mean, and then I shift it over, okay, it's supposed to be the same picture. Plus B. Okay? Um, I'm looking at the distance to the center, okay? I'm squaring the distance, okay? And, and multiplying by probability. Well, the probabilities are the same, right? The areas on the, the little areas on the little rectangles, okay? And the squares of the distances are the same, okay? Does that mean the variance of the constant is zero? That is correct. A variance of a constant, a variance of b equals the variance of zero, which is zero. Yeah. Okay. A variance of a constant is zero. Uh, you can think of uh, well, you can think of just a delta function at, at, at b. Okay. In other words, it is possible to have a distribution function that is zero and then jumps to one there. That's the distribution function, right? So, in other words, all the probability mass is associated with the point b variable equals b with probability of 1, all right? Then that b is obviously equal to the mean. The distance to b is 0 squared multiplied by 1. You get 0 squared times 1. That's the variance, OK? So the variance is 0. The variance of your constant is 0. So therefore, the standard deviation of, of random variable of uh, a uniform random variable on the interval 100 to 200. So the, here, the, the, hopefully the, the notation is clear that when I talk about uniform random variable on A, B, I'm talking, I'm talking about uniform random variable on an interval. All right, that means I picked a number at random between 100 and 200. That's equal also to just the length of the interval divided by the square root of 12. It's the length of the interval. Maybe I should put 190 to 290. So it's clear what I'm talking about. Right. It's the length of the interval so divided by the square root of 12. So b minus a over 12. Square root of 12. 
Well, it's recorded 12. <laughs> okay, if you want to put the, and it's in the back of the book on page A2. Okay, as well. If you want to look in the appendix, if you forget, there's a handy dandy table in there. Continuous distributions. Uh, I think it's in the back. Maybe I lied. Poisson, the normal gamma uniform is not listed. Okay, I think it's only has a very short list, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> this table's kind of small. Okay? But there it is. Okay? So that's a little, some of the tricks. Okay, so now we're going to deal with the variance of a, unit, of a single variable, right? We need to know the properties of variance. Okay? What about the variance of a sum? That's what I'm coming back to. Right, first I noticed that indeed the marginals are uniform. Okay? But clearly these variables are not independent unless alpha is equal to zero. Okay? They're not independent unless alpha equals to zero. Correlation it's not the correlation. This is this 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 was constructed. This was some kind of remember that uh, weird thing called the copula or whatever, which is a uh -huh. form of a part of speech somehow. If you look in the dictionary, there's a cupula which is like a little roof, and there's a copula. There's a different word where you change the u and the o. Don't ask me who came up with this. Okay. <laughs> I looked it up afterwards because I made a mistake last time. It's some form of grammar or something, some some grammatical definition. I don't know what it is. Okay, I've never heard of it before. Anyway, it's some kind of connection word or something. Yes, must be black anyway. It's it's a um, anyway. So the alpha connects all these different densities together. Okay, they all have uniform um, marginals, these joint densities, okay? But the, the two, the, the joint density is not the density of independent variables unless alpha is equal to zero. It is not the correlation coefficient, I don't believe. We'll actually can come out and figure out what the correlation coefficient is here in just a minute. And uh, maybe you will be justified. Okay. <laughs> But what is the variance of x plus y? How, how would I do it if I had to do it by hand? How would I calculate the variance of x plus y here? I will have to do it by hand here. Okay, how will I do that? I will calculate the expectation. I'll use the shortcut method. I'm going to go ahead and calculate the expectation of the square of the sum minus the sum minus the expectation of the sum squared. Now this, I, uh, now what I'm going to do is, I guess I'll just go ahead and um, write it all out. This, I can expand this here, but since I'm going to have to take expectation, now the expectation when I've got more than one random variable in there, I just go ahead and write out the function, and then integrate against the density, the joint density. idea. So it looks like a little bit of integration. It's just calculation now. I mean, it's just integration. Minus, here I can actually um, save a little bit of time because I, know the ex because I know the expectation of the sum is the sum of expectations. That's EX plus EY. Right? And EX equals EY equals a half. Question. Yeah. Could you like multiply that x plus y squared yes, you out, could, out. You and then do that. write down the yeah. expectation and all that? Yeah, you or could. Yeah. I get expectation x squared plus expectation 2xy plus expectation y squared. Mm -hmm. And they'll have three uniforms. Okay? <laughs> so I'll just do it here, and, and then I'll expand it. I'll expand it this stage anyway. So it's just a matter of which order you do it x squared plus 2xy plus y squared times. 1 plus alpha, 1 minus 2x, 1 minus 2y, dy dx, both integrals are from 0 to 1. So I have to do a lot of calculation there. Minus, just this business, which we said was a half plus a half the quantity squared. Okay? So there's the variance of x plus y. Now there's a bunch of chicken scratch on the bottom of the notes 10, page 1 of notes 10, where I actually go through all the arithmetic 
I think I'm going to skip it, all right? Because for this hour, because it's just a bunch of easy integrals. Um, and if I do this, it's up to be. Um, um, The ones cancel basically. I think this, if I do x squared plus 2x squared plus y squared, what is that? That's a th third. No, that's. Oh, well, that's more than that's more than one. This is a third plus a third plus um, a half. Right? A third plus a third plus a half is a sixth. A third, if I do this inter double integral of y squared, do this double integral of 2xy, do the double integral of x squared, I get a third plus a half plus a third. Then you get y squared from 0 to 1, you get a third, and then you integrate that number, one third from 0 to 1, you still get a third. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It's similar to this one, third here. Okay? The 2xy, well, do 2y, you get 1, and then do x, you get a half. Okay? So a third plus a third plus a half is a sixth. You get a sixth without any alpha coefficient, minus 1. I mean, a 1 and a sixth. Did I say 1 sixth? 1 and a sixth. Okay? Third, that's probably what was confusing. A third plus a third plus a half is 1 and 1 sixth. Okay? And then you have minus 1. So anyway, integral comes out like this. So it comes out alpha over 18 plus a sixth. Okay? So I'll just show part of the computation <laughs> so you can see what's going on. That's, so the actual variance depends on, and now that is a not negative number, even when alpha is negative one. All right? So uh, alpha is between minus one and one. So that's the variance of the sum. Now, let's go to the next page. What, how could I get the variance of the sum more generally? Would there be a way to organize the computation in general? So the, the moral of the story is that, indeed, uh, the answer, uh, I have a whole one-parameter family of random variables. Each have the same mean and the same variance. And in fact, they're both uniform, OK, in all those cases. Yet, uh, the variance depends on alpha, okay? So I can't know the variance of the sum without knowing the joint density in general. Without knowing alpha in this example. All right? So I thought that was a good example of top on the fact that you don't know how to get the variance unless maybe you would know in the independence case. Now, what do you know in the independence case? That's the case of alpha equal to zero, and it doesn't, you know, so in this mean that this means that alpha is equal to zero. For this example, it does. Okay. For this example, not all joint. <laughs> this is one specific family of joint densities. Okay. Well, is it true? Is this true for all independent um, random variables, though? That if they're independent, then um, if we know the variance and the means, then we'll know the variance of the sum. Yes, indeed. How will you do that? If x and y are dependent, special case. If x and y are dependent, random variables. With variances, let's just just talk about the variances: sigma one squared and sigma two squared, respectively. Then, and maybe I'll need the means with means mu1 and mu2 and variances. Because I'm going to use mu1 and mu2 in the computation, so they're going to go out in the end. Okay, then what's the variance of the sum? Then variance of the sum, I claim, is simply sigma1 squared plus sigma2 squared. Now that made sense over here. Because we said the variance of uniform was a 12. The 12 plus a 12 plus a 6. Okay, so this is consistent. Okay. From 
regression proof or sketch them for how you do it. Well, you just go ahead and start right here. Well, now I'm going to expand it out. I will expand it out so I have this. Okay. I'm just going to reuse that so I don't have to write it down again. You don't mind. I'm the board. Uh, variance of x plus y is equal to this. Now expand it out. So that's equal to the variance of x plus y is equal to e of x squared. So now I will go ahead and take G's suggestion and I'll write it out like this. The reason that I'll do that is that I can handle the e of xy term <coughs> this time <coughs> because of independence. So this is e of x squared. And now I'm going to also, I get three terms here also for the ex plus ey. So I'll just say ex squared minus mu1 squared. This is, this is mu1 and this is mu2, right? Plus 2 e of xy minus mu1 mu2 plus e of y squared minus mu2 squared. So you get a 2 mu1 mu2 when I multiply this uh, mu1 plus mu2 out. Well, I'm using that mu1 plus mu2 is equal to mu1 squared plus 2 mu1 mu2 plus mu2 squared. term is, this is this term, okay? So I'm subtracting the mu1 squared from the e of x squared, I'm subtracting the 2 mu1 and mu2 from the e, from the 2 e x y, and I'm subtracting the mu2 squared from the e y squared. All right, that's very nice. This is what you do. This is the variance of x, this is the variance of y, so both of them are in there. And then there's some cross term. So this is sigma1 squared, this is sigma2 squared, and what's this? Zero. This is zero in the independence case, but not zero in general. This is plus two times, what is e x y in the independence case? Mu one, mu one, two. It is, yeah, two times, I write like this, f sub x, this is x, y, f sub x, x, f sub y of y, dy dx, minus mu one, mu two. I can write it like that. Because I'm in the independence case, I take the marginal densities, multiply them with the joint density, and then I have x, y. That's the thing I have to take the expectation of. Now that's, and if I have it in this general format, I can put minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity, just for the, the formula. Right? So how do I do this? x, y, f, x, x, f, y, y, d, y, d, x. Remember that from your first course, right? In the independence case, the expectation of product is a product of expectations. That's what you remember from the first course. Maybe you're willing to believe it here. I'm just recalling that, how you do it. While you have a rectangular region of integration, and you have a product function, right? Function of x, x times f of x, and y times f sub y of y. Right? So you just break it up into a product of two integrals, and that's mu one times mu two. Okay, so this is mu1 times mu2 when you multiply it out. Okay. Okay, so that gives you zero. All right? In the middle. In the independence case, it gives you zero. So when it's dependent, this is not mu1 times mu2? Right. Well, obviously. Okay. Oh. Because this is the sigma1 squared plus sigma2 squared right here. That's what's nice about this example. It shows explicitly what the answer is so that you can't get confused. This is a sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared. And this is a cross product term. So this is the middle term. This is the middle term. Right here, the alpha over 18. So what does it tell us? It tells us what this, answer, what this is. And now what we're going to do in general is we're going to give this thing a definition. Okay, we're going to define that to be the covariance between x and y. 
And so we're going to call it, and we're going to give it a name. We're going to call this, so now we're going to define, define the covariance between x and y. So the covariance is equal to zero if x is If they're independent, yeah. Dxy minus mu1 mu2. And this can also be written, it turns out, by a little, by just multiplying out and so on and using properties of expectation, this simply is equal to the expectation of the mixed product x minus mu1 times y minus mu2. So in this way, it actually generalizes the variance because if I take x equal to y, which then I wouldn't have a joint density, but it doesn't matter. I can still talk about x and y being the same variable, all right? Then I would get x minus mu1, x minus mu1, right? Which is the square of x minus mu1, which is, and the expectation of that is the variance. That's the alternative form for the variance. So this generalizes the variance. You no. Know, covariance x and x equals the variance of x. And we're going to use that over and over when we make the covariance computations. Well, I mean, I mean that when I try to calculate the variance of something, I write it as the covariance of itself with itself, all right? And then I expand that. We're going to have certain properties we can expand. The covariance has certain properties. It's nice. It kind of, if, if, if it weren't for this, you know, like, uh, confusing uh, subtraction of the mean here, what does this look like? The expectation of this product here. Uh, this is values with associated probabilities. This is values with associated probabilities. Well, this associated joint probability. So, um, does it tell us how the two variables are related or something? It gives you some information. It gives you some information. This is, it gives out this alpha in that example, right? Because the the covariance is um, one half of that, so it's alpha one thirty-six. All right. So it gives you some information. It doesn't maybe it doesn't tell you what the joint density is. Right? It gives you some information. Right. So you might you might guess that if you have all possible mixed moments, okay, e x minus b1 to the power a, y minus b2 to the b, let's say for integers a, non-negative integers a and b, then you have all the information, okay? So for example, you know, so the variance would be the case where you put a equals 2 and b equals 0, the variance of the one and the variance of the other. So all possible mixed moments, you might say you have all the information, okay? But here is the one that we didn't have, where we actually had some some non-negative power with x on x and on y. The first easiest one, okay? Or non-trivial one, okay? Where we had x and y involved. What are the properties of the covariance? It turns out to have properties very similar to an inner product. Remember the, um, the dot product from Cal 3 or, or, or linear algebra, you had inner products in general? I think most people have had those courses. Haven't you? What? Did you take linear algebra? Yeah. Cal 3? Okay. <laughs> you had dot products and stuff of uh -huh. vectors? Uh -huh. Cross products. Dot Cross products and dot products. I'm talking about dot products. Yeah. Okay, or inner products. Yeah, because mm -hmm. the dot product of itself is the square yeah. of the length, right? Yeah. So remember this, you had, if you have u, v, then you have the properties that the inner product of, um, of a constant times u and another constant times v. And if, if you had scalar, scalar multiples, then you would get, if this is a real inner product, you would get c, d, u, v, that kind of stuff. Remember that kind of stuff? You can scale out the constants and then uh, you'd also have u plus v inner product with w would be equal to u inner product w plus v inner product w, that kind of stuff.
operations. Um, all right. Those are also going to be shared by this covariance operation. So if I take the covariance between A, X, and B, Y, I'm going to get A, B times the covariance between X and Y. You can see how this generalizes the variance case because I took A, if I took AX and AX, I would get A squared covariance XX, which would be the A squared variance X. In other words, the variance of AX equals A squared the variance of X relation. This contains that relationship that we derived a little bit earlier. Also, if you add constants X plus C, Y plus D, that doesn't change the covariance at all. Now that's the one that you don't have in the inner product case, all right? But here's the, here's the kicker. If you identify the vector as the random variable plus all possible constants, okay, in other words, the coset, so to speak, of x plus c, where c ranges, there's no little algebra that makes more sense. In other words, you can talk about um, one random variable being equivalent to another if they're only a constant apart. Right? If they're just a shift of one another, those are equivalent. Okay? This is one vector. Okay? Think of it as one vector. So, um, so you can think of it that way. So sorry for all the extra words, but this is true. So if you if you do that identification actually, then you can actually construct a vector space, and it is this is in fact an inner product under that identification. Okay, it doesn't matter if I add the C here; it'll still it'll be the same. Okay. So uh, and let's see. Uh, yeah, the. Uh, Variance of x with x is the variance of x, which would be you think of as the uh, square of the inner product. Okay? I should know the square, the square of the norm. Okay? So the variance of x you would think of as the, the u with u is what you talk about the square of the length of the length. Okay? That would correspond to the variance. All right, so those properties. What else? I think I listed some other ones here. I'm not stating the theorem really. Uh, covariance of x plus y and z, I need to put that one. This is the third property that I needed. x plus y and z is equal to the covariance of x with z and plus the covariance of y with z. And also the symmetry. We have in the real inner product, you have a symmetry. The inner product of u and v is the same as the inner product of v and u. And we're talking about real random variables here. All real numbers, okay. So, the covariance between x and y, between y and x, okay. And, okay. and the covariance of x and x is equal to the variance of x Those are the properties. I may have listed them in a slightly different order than the author. Uh, we should probably have a statistical idea of what the covariance, how the, when the covariance, what the covariance is. When should it be positive, when negative, and stuff like that. And so what you do is you draw some pictures where you can tell what is going on. So I'm just going to put, I'm going to put again the dots for the joint density. Okay. And I won't make it, I'll just make it sort of like this. Okay. Okay, so if that's the joint density uh, dot picture, representation of the joint density with dots, I didn't put too much density, but just pretend for the time. Okay? Let's say, and then I would have, let's say, the mu1 is here, mu2 is here on the x and y axis. So then that gives you kind of a new set of. Uh, recenter the, the data there at the uh, u1, u2. Okay, so I'll draw a new 
uh, set of axes. New crosshairs there. Okay. So what would be if that's what would what would be the expected value of this mixed uh, product of deviations from the uh, center of view one and view two? Right. If you take a point here, then this distance is x minus view one, right? And this distance is y minus view two. And for every, you're basically taking the dots. For every dot, you're taking one product like that, and you're adding. You're just adding up over the dots. Because the dots, where the dots, the dots will be more numerous where the density is bigger. That's the way the dots work. Okay. So, are you just taking um, to where all the dots go up to? So you're basically taking the the covariance. The, the idea of this dot picture is that the covariance between x and y is simply summation x i minus mu one times y j minus mu two double sum on i and j. So you're taking the areas of. Um, oh, divided by the total number of dots. Divided by the total number of dots. Double sum i j. One. Okay? So taking a very large number of dots, the dots represent the joint density. There are more dots, numerous, where the density is higher, according to the, just the height of the density, right? So, in your mind's eye, can you, can you visualize the density as just the whole, uh, like a zillion of dots? Take a, I mean, you can think of it in terms of ink, right? If you take the height of the density as a certain <laughs> blackness of the ink, Right? And then when it's gray, it's kind of medium level, and it's whitish, and it's very low level density, and so on. It's just the number of dots per unit area. That's the density. So if both of those qualities are positive, then it's greater than zero. If they're, they're both, both positive, negative, if they're both negative, negative, it's greater than zero. So you get positive contributions in the first and the third quadrants relative to the new crosshairs, OK? And, and then you get negative contributions here. Side. Well, negative contributions here in the second and fourth quadrants, but also the contributions are smaller according to this picture I made where there was an upward trend of the data. Even though it wasn't linear, it was kind of curvilinear, it was still enough trend to the upper right and no coming back down. So covariance can be negative? I mean, not coming back down enough to, to mess up the thing where this could be. So this covariance is positive in this picture. Is everybody clear about that? We have positive contributions in most of the contributions from the first and third quadrants, and then some contributions, but smaller from the second and fourth. And if it was the other way around, the covariance would be negative. Right. And of course, you can have covariance zero by having in, in, in the totally dependent case. You can have covariance zero because all I have to do is make a parabola. Okay. So that by symmetry, everything is going to cancel out. To make an exact parabola. <laughs> okay. If you have a perfectly symmetrical distribution, it's going to be. Well, look, suppose I take y equals x squared, where x is 1 minus 1 to 1. Okay? Let's take x uniform on minus 1 to 1, and y equals to x squared. Then you don't really have a joint density, but you can still talk about the dots. Okay? And so I have dots like this, okay, on here. All right, where the dot, if I project the dots, they're uniformly distributed on the interval minus one to one, okay? So if you want to take the dots on the unit interval and put them up on the parabola, okay? On the, on the interval, okay? And then put them up there. Now, if I take this computation, uh, obviously I get positive here and negative contributions here equal. So the covariance is zero. The covariance between x and x squared is obviously zero in this case. So is there a bound on what so the covariance is independent? Okay, there, are, there is, okay, what do we have? Uh, there is something to do with covariance. Covariance uh, is an inner product, remember? What do you have whenever you have an inner product? 
You have Cauchy Schwartz inequality. A what? Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Remember That's that? But it, you, if I just have certain properties, all those properties that I mentioned over here, this one would be not negative or something like that, and it's actually equal to zero if and only if take the zero ver zero and equal to zero if and only if u is zero. Okay, I don't think I even need that. That I don't that property I don't actually need to get the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Cauchy Schwartz inequality says the absolute value of this quantity after taking all those properties over there, including symmetry. Yeah, I know. This is less than this is less than or equal to square. This is the norm of u times the norm of v. Okay, which is the square root of the u u square root of the v v. So what that gives in our case immediately, and they gave a proof. They gave a proof of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and it's probably what's exactly in the book. It's a kind of a nice one, but there's a proof of it right there in your book, in one of those theorems. Okay? That this gives it the covariance between x and y in absolute values is less than or equal to the product of the standard deviations. Okay? So there's a bound. Is that what you're asking for? Yeah. Okay. So what I and normally, and another notation is also this is called sigma sub x y. Why they just call it a, a sigma and rather than a sigma squared sub x y is a little confusing. But because they don't put the square on because it's not a non negative quantity. But the fact that, it, okay, the sigma basically, the number of subscript fins gives you the units. Okay? So in other words, it says units of x and units of y. So mixed units. Okay, units of x times units of y. Alright? A sigma sub x would only have units of x. Alright? But a sigma sub x y would have units of x times units of y. Alright? A sigma sub x squared, of course, would be a non negative quantity that had units of x quantity squared. So that way the notation makes sense. Alright? So what they say is that this quantity, which can be positive or negative, is less than or equal to sigma sub x. Of course, sigma sub x is only positive. This can be positive or negative. That's the other confusing thing. Okay? Sigma sub x times sigma sub y. So it's not the perfect notation, but it is used. Alright? For the covariance, just to shorten the notation. Okay? So the quantity will always be smaller? This is always less than or equal to an absolute value from this product. Okay? This is a standard deviation of x, this is a standard deviation of y, this is the covariance between x and y. That's the notation. So it's Kind of confusing notation. Um, so this is a fact, theorem. Okay. Um, okay. Now we're getting into properties of covariance, boy. Let's see what. Where is this theorem proof? I need to do some more stuff today. Otherwise, it won't be able to get your homework. This is theorem B, page one forty-three. The reason we're bringing all this covariance stuff in is that the inner product is very useful for doing computations. So, and we're going to want to do that. There's some nice little examples we have in the book. One with uh, investments, okay, and returns on investments, kind of a business example that you uh, want to study. Okay, <laughs> and it is one homework problem. One of the long homework problems involves this return on investments. Another problem involves the prediction. Um, okay, so then you're going to define the correlation coefficient. Rho is going to be when you do this thing. Usually, usually this inequality is associated with like the angle between two vectors, right? If you have two vectors, u and v, then you have this theta, the angle between them, at least in two and three dimensions, okay, for the Euclidean geometry. We can talk about, but since this cauchy schwartz inequality holds in general, because of this thing, you can always talk about the cosine of the angle, 
you can define an angle, you can do vectors in general in an inner product space by taking the ratio of the unabsolute value inner product by the product of the lengths. So in other words, I can define cosine theta to be defined to be equal to the inner product u v over the product lengths. And in fact, this does correspond to the angle theta between the two vectors in two or three dimensional Euclidean geometry. Okay? So what I'm, pro is going to be the, the same thing. It's going to be the cosine of theta. So this is going to be the sigma of x, y divided by sigma x, sigma y. <coughs> okay? The covariance divided by the product of standard deviations. And pro is, so if we define it that way, then automatically by Cauchy Schwartz, automatically by this theorem, theorem B, page 143, you have that rho is between minus 1 and 1. Okay. And it's also, you know, the correlation between x and y. Now, this, the correlation is not now the same as the covariance. The correlation is unitless. So, C-O-R-R. -R. So, there's just the various notations for it. It's unitless. It's so, units of x times units of y divided by units of x times units of y. If the variables are independent, rho is zero. Now, what was rho in that example with that uh, was with the alpha in it? The example with the alpha in it. Well, you that was what you were asking. Is that the correlation proof? Remember, Chase? <laughs> okay. I'm just going to bring you back to that. For the example above. I'm running out of ink. So much ink to spill on this lecture. Oh, there we go. For example, above with alpha in it. Okay. All right. The the um, correlate. What is the correlation? The correlation would be the covariance between x and y divided by the product of standard deviation. The product of each standard deviation was the square root of one twelve. Right? So this came out to be the alpha over 18 plus a 6 divided by the square root of 12 times the square root of 12. Okay. There's a 12th at the bottom, so multiply by 12, and you get um, 2. Wasn't the covariance alpha over 32? Sorry, it was alpha over 30. You're right, it was alpha over 36. That's better. Be. The 2, the 2 times the covariance was alpha over 18. So it means the covariance was alpha over 36. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have 1 plus 1, 6 here at all. There's no 1, 6. Why over 1, not 1 over alpha over 18? I was, the, var the, the variance of the sum, the variance of the sum was. Uh, was alpha over 18 plus a 6, mm -hmm. which was equal to variance of x plus variance of y plus twice the covariance between x and y. X that would follow by uh, right this is a covariance of its, with itself. Mm -hmm. You would get variance of x plus you would get covariance xx plus covariance yy plus co twice covariance xy. If you expand this thing out, mm -hmm. it's covariance of x plus y, x plus y. You're going to have to do that. You're gonna, there's a theorem that says how to do that. It's just harder to rewrite. I just better to look at it uh, first. It would be covariance xx plus covariance x, just as an inner product, right? Plus covariance yy plus covariance xy plus covariance xy. So you get variance of x plus variance of y plus two covariance xy. That's not a bad little formula to remember for the variance of the sum. All right? That was alpha over 18 plus a 6. The variance of x was the variance of y, we said was the 6. Therefore, the covariance between x and y was alpha over 36. So now I have it right. Thank you for fixing this up. All right? So that was, and so multiply by 12, so this gives alpha over 3. So it wasn't quite the alpha, it was alpha over 3. <laughs> that was the correlation coefficient. Okay? It was pretty close. <laughs> 
All right? So that was between minus one third and one third. So we actually never got uh, a negative one correlation or a plus one correlation in that example. Okay? That was a good pen. Where was that good pen? Is it? Yeah, but then, okay. All right, let's go on. So now I, we sort of think we know what we're doing. <laughs> uh, there is this idea of how do I do a calculation? How do I find a general formula for the variance of AX to B1? You're going to need to know how to do that. Do what? Well, let's just go ahead and look back. How would I find a general formula for the variance of AX plus BY? Let's recapitulate what we were just doing. He shows this in one of the um, theorems. Theorem um, corollary A, page 140. He's got the um, covariance in action there for calculating the variance of the sum. But then he's got this correlation coefficient defined later, and I want to do I want to combine those two that definition with the formula on page 140 and get the variance of the sum. So he never quite writes this down, all right? The way I'm going to write it down, except in an example. So I want to do the example for you. Example: find a general formula. for the variance of AX plus BY in terms of uh, A, B, uh, sigma X squared, sigma Y squared, and the correlation between X and Y. Let's just put sigma X, sigma Y, and correlation, those, those parameters. Okay. Here's how you would do it. I'm going to derive essentially the corollary page 140 and then throw in this definition for the correlation coefficient. So the variance of AX plus BY, the way you do it is you write that as an inner product of itself, AX plus BY. Covariance of AX plus BY with AX plus BY. Now expand using the properties of covariance. That will be A squared covariance X with X plus, let's see, I'll get, does everybody follow that I'll get a covariance BY with AX and a covariance BY with AX? So it'll give me, and then the A and the B will scale out by the scaling. So 2AB covariance between X and Y plus b squared times the variance, I can write it down as the variance of y, this is the covariance of y with itself, I will write it down that way. Okay. The covariance of x with itself gives you the sigma x squared plus 2ab. How can I write down the covariance between x and y? Which is these parameters. Yeah, right here. Yeah, rho equals sigma x y over sigma x sigma y. And therefore, sigma x y is rho times sigma x times sigma y. Plus b squared sigma y squared. So this is another way to think of the core the, the covariance. Okay, is that it's a joint measure of some kind of dependence, rho, and variabilities. Joint measure of dependence and variabilities, where rho is actually called the coefficient of linear dependence. <laughs> okay, it's not a coefficient of dependence because we know that we can have dependent variables, yet rho is equal to zero. So it doesn't it doesn't, cor it, doesn't cor it doesn't correlate quote unquote to exact independence. 
right? Rho equal to zero does not correspond to independence. Oh, it is implied by independence. Independence implies rho equal to zero, but rho equal to zero does not imply independence. What? So it's not, okay. All right, so we talk so about it. So we can't it, go back and so forth. We talk, no. So if we rho talk about uh, it being a coefficient of linear dependence, it turns out that um, if x and y are linearly related, then they're independent. Well, of course, they're not going to be linearly independent. They're related. Okay. But, uh, no. You'll see where this coefficient of linear dependence comes in. Uh, let's see, how would I say that? Well, um, as if I was going to make a uh, Taylor expansion, okay? One variable in terms of the other, okay? Then the linear term would go out, but roll with zero. There wouldn't be any linear term. So, if covariance zero doesn't mean the two variables are independent? No. No. But it's, a, it's a one way and not the other. What I showed here with this example is covariance is zero, but they're not independent. Y is totally dependent on x. It's a, it's a functional relation. Y equals x squared. Six, so that's, that's the dependence you can get. All right? But the covariance is zero. Covariance equals zero, yet x and y independent. Dependent. Dependent. Okay? Not independent. So independence implies a covariance of zero, but not vice versa. All right? So it just turns out that they can be independent. That's the bad news. Okay? So All right? Yeah, so dependence doesn't correspond to right angles, in other words. The vectors would be at right angles, but they can still be dependent. Now, for certain classes of random variables, like jointly Gaussian variables, then there is an exact correspondence, independence versus um, correlation B0, okay? But for the general case, it's not. All right. We have about five minutes or less. No, we're almost all done. I think we have two minutes left. Okay, so I wanted to get a little bit more into the formulas. I think I can skip that first example on notes 11 here. Let me give you notes 11. You might get a little out of these if you're trying to do your homeworks this weekend. Um, should have given this out at the beginning. Um, there's something called the conditional expectation that you're going to have to know about. So, what is the conditional expectation? I should at least define that. Remember all that conditional density and stuff like that? Well, now you're going to need to use it. Okay, you probably didn't have this in the first course at all. So what you're going to define is the expected value of y given x equals to x. What all you're going to do is you're going to take the mean of the conditional density. I mean, the conditional density is the density of y for a fixed x, right? So this would simply be interval y times f y given x, y given x, d y, okay, minus infinity or infinity, where this is the conditional density of y given x equal to x. Remember, for each little x, you get a density. We'll just work in the density case, all right? Don't worry about it. That other thing with my joint, you know, joint densities and stuff for now, okay? So this is a conditional density, so think of that as a density in y. It's just, all right? So, for example, if if, uh, if, example, here's going to be something out of your, out of your book. Example, if, if uh, x is exponential of rate lambda, 
okay? And given x equals x, y is uniform on 0 to x, which makes sense because x is a non-negative quantity, all right? So that means then what we have is that we have f sub x of x is equal to lambda e to the minus lambda x, x greater than 0. And we have that the conditional density, f y given x, y given x. We know, we've done this, we did this on the test, right? <laughs> this is 1 over x, 0 less than y less than x. Okay? So now, one question would be, well, what's the mean of y? And, we can, and it turns out that you can get by first considering what the mean of y given x is. The mean of y given x equals little x is simply because the, the because of this density being a uniform, what's the mean of a uniform? It's half the it's in the middle of the interval, right? So that's simply x over two. I don't have to do any uh, do the integration if you want. It's integral y times one over x dx from zero to x if you want. Okay? That turns out to be x squared over two divided by x. The, the one over x is constant. The x is constant here. Remember the x is fixed. The y I forgot my, I said dy, not dx. <laughs> so I even messed it up. dy, alright? Equals x over 2. So that's what the conditional mean is. It's actually a function. It comes out to be a function of x. It's, and so in general, I can talk about h of x. Now what would it be intuitively? Look at it this way. Take your dot picture. This is the last thing I'll do because we have to be out of time now. Take your dot picture of a joint density. Okay? Make it sparse some places or whatever, but then make it heavier over here or something like that. And then sparse over here and so on. And sure. Try to get the whole picture somehow. Okay. What would the conditional, what would h of x look like as a function of x? <laughs> okay. There's the joint density. I didn't do a great job, but what would the uh, h of x p. Well, what it is is this. Basically, you fix x, right, and there's the, the dots there in that vertical line corresponds to the conditional density. Now, what's the mean of a bunch of dots? It's just the average of those dots on the y-axis, right? So take the average of those dots, and somewhere in the middle, right? But the average of these dots here, look at how many there are down here, and there's only a few up here, so then the average is going to be pulled down. So, basically, you know, it's, it's going to look like this or something. Okay? Okay? So that's what h of x is. Now the question is, from that, can you calculate what the mean of y is? What's the expected value of y? In this example, if you see, if you try to find the density of y, you're going to be all messed up. This is a homework problem. The density of y is nasty. Because you have to integrate what would the density of y be? f sub y of y would be integral. The joint density is lambda e to the minus lambda x times 1 over x, right? And then um, dx, and then x goes from y to infinity, right? How am I going to do that integral? No way I'm going to be able to do that integral, right? 1 over x. Well, maybe if I did a little integration by parts, I could get out of this. I doubt it. Probably just get worse. You just get worse, right? So you're not going to be able to find that marginal density. So you're going to need this theorem in the book. The theorem in the book is the expected value of y is the expected value of this integral, expected value over x of the h of, of the conditional expectation. What does this mean? Expected value over x? In other words, I mean, this is an integral over x. This is a function of x, right? This is x over 2. What? I'm going to take the expected value of x over 2. Which is tri trivial almost. Pretty exponential. So you take the so this comes out to be the expected value of x over 2. In other words, it becomes an x integral. I'll have to explain this more next time. You simply get it as an x integral. You don't go to the y integral. You do it as an x integral. Similar, similar as when we said you don't have to change the density and do the y integral. You can just do the x integral. So it'll be the expected value of h of x? Yeah.
that's good. That's a good rule. Okay? So he's got a really excellent example here. All right, thank you for the extra technique. <laughs>